Disclaimer. Inpatient mental health treatment historically has a very dark history, and that's putting it lightly. One of the diagnoses that you could receive in these dark times might be nymphomania. What was the criteria for this diagnosis? You were a woman and you liked sex. Women who had been raped, sexually abused, had given birth to children outside of marriage, or were sex workers were often committed, often by their family who was ashamed of them and their circumstances. What was the treatment for these women? Treatment entailed more sexual abuse and substantial trauma. Because, yeah, that's what fixes things. So there was forceful examination and diagnosis that was made based on just normal presentation of a woman's genitals. Like, nothing had to really be abnormal out of place or just look any different. They just decided. Kind of like the Salem witch trials or any of the witch trials. You know, they've already decided they're going to find that confirmation. So they did things like cold water douches, bloodletting, um, and being assaulted by the doctor to relieve hysteria. Originally, hysteria was considered to be a woman's ailment, an illness that was often coming from needing a sexual release or just whatever dumb shit they came up with. So it was really common for physicians to claim that women's genitalia were the root cause of many mental health issues outside of just hypersexuality or promiscuity, uh, even physical ailments. In reality, though, those physical ailments and mental health issues that they were having were more likely to be connected to having, like, multiple pregnancies, being completely overworked. But, of course, that was beyond consideration since women were believed to be built for continuous pregnancy. So, as always, everything exists on a spectrum, and so did nymphomania in the minds of physicians around this time. The spectrum of unladylike behavior could range from just suggestive looks to extreme sexual attacks on men. You could just look at someone in a lustful way and there's off to, off to the loony bin for you. Quite the difference in extremes, I would say. So there were certain choices that women could make that they thought were risk factors for nymphomania. Those risk factors include impure thoughts, masturbation, and eating chocolate. Yes, chocolate. Oftentimes, surgical removal of the reproductive organs may also be considered as an extreme treatment of this condition. So, so what about men? For men, there was a comparable ailment named satyriasis. There's a big difference though, besides it being between men and women. Women were considered hopeless and damned to a life in the asylum when they had nymphomania, generally. While men were considered more likely to learn to control themselves in a normal life. The idea was that if men were married and were given access to regular sexual encounters, that this would just solve this problem for them. So let's talk about how this presents in horror. The trope of the promiscuous lady is common in my observations of asylum-based horror. We now know that that is because it is somewhat factual. Women were commonly committed due to this diagnosis. The part that is likely not as accurate is the way that some of these women can be depicted in the actual movies. Often, the nymphomaniac is a woman who attempts to seduce anyone who comes across them in these stories. In one of the movies that I've watched that I hate, the nymphomaniac character was only spotted twice, and they're never like a main character, generally. So, let me give you an example of the way that this woman was depicted in this specific garbage movie that I hate. Um, so the first sighting was during an introduction to the main character being walked through the facility. A nurse was giving this individual a tour. They walked past the room with an open door where a woman is sitting naked, faced away from the door, and appears to be very furiously masturbating. And they just kind of walk or walk away and like, mm, can't even like pull the door shut or something. So later in this same movie, this person is seen being raped by a security guard. She appears to be dissociated and completely disconnected from the experience. Um, it's very alarming. The main character actually witnesses this. He walks past the room, stops, sees it, and instead of calling for help or trying to stop, he just walks away. And of course, later when the security guard is accused of murder, it is very briefly mentioned that he assaulted a patient. That's it. Oftentimes, women in horror that are depicted as nymphomaniacs do experience sexual assault, rape, or worse, 
the worst example may be Shelley in American Horror Story. Um, she's very hypersexual uh, and is vocal about how much she enjoys sex. She will try to seduce or sway employees and others using sexual favor. But things don't turn out so well for her. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But she ends up being punished in a messed up way. Should this trope be used in horror? I don't know. Sex sells. And it presents as a convenient way to grab attention in horror or anything. Sex is a part of life. So it's not that I think it shouldn't be included in horror. That would be silly. It should absolutely not be ignored that this is a part of our history and we shouldn't forget about it. The dark yet historical facts should be observed through the critical lens of social commentary and we should think about how this interacts and impacts women in more modern challenges. Like I said, horror has a uh, mixed relationship with women. That's okay. Most of the world does. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Let me know what topics you would like me to cover and I'll see you again soon.